This is All Out Politics at R of News Debate and Analysis, live from the heart of Westminster. Coming up, turning up the weather pressure, a major new climate warning as the UK ranks top 10 for heat, rain and sun for the first time ever. Breaking news, a new pivoting record. The NHS app sends out more than 689,000 alerts. Hello, up, welcome uh, to ITV News. Percent. We'll have the latest. More holidays on the horizon, though. The Foreign Secretary signals extra countries could be moved onto the green list in spite of concern about inbound variants. We're increasingly confident that more countries will go uh, to, 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 uh, on, on the, uh, either on Amber or, or, or on the The fight for Unite as the union leader Len McCluskey bows out a special look at the takeover candidates and their consequences for British politics. Incredibly proud after retiring to focus on raising her family, the British rower Helen Glover narrowly misses out on a medal in the Olympics. Every stroke I took before London and before Rio was thinking about gold and outcome and this time it's been about journey. But uh, Team GB's success continues. Uh, we're going to speak to the fiancé of Mallory Franklin, the canoe star who's just picked up silver in the slalom. Good morning, this is All Out Politics and we begin today with a stark warning about the scale of change impacting the country's climate. The Met Office has revealed that for the first time since records began, last year, 2020, the UK's weather ranked in the top 10 for heat, rainfall and sunshine. The new report warns that British summers could start regularly to hit 40 degrees Celsius, that's 104 degrees Fahrenheit, even if global warming targets are met. It says, last year was the third warmest on record, with the highest temperature recorded in July reaching 37.8 degrees Celsius. 2020 was also the fifth wettest, with the total average rainfall reaching over 1,300 millimetres. And it was also the eighth sunniest on record, averaging almost 1,500 hours of bright sunshine. The last 30 years have uh, been 0.9 degrees Celsius warmer than the 30 years before across all months and all countries, uh, nations in the UK. The, the greatest warming has been across the East Midlands and East Anglia, where average annual temperatures have increased by more than one degree Celsius. The least warming occurred around western coastal fringes in parts of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Rainfall's been on the rise too. Over the last three decades, the UK has been 6% wetter on average than three decades before that. Six of the 10 wettest years have occurred since 1998. Last year saw some significant weather extremes, including severe flooding from heavy rainfall in February. One of the areas affected was Avonmouth in Bristol. From there, our climate change correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, reports. Avonmouth on the River Severn. Flooding is a part of life here, but it's getting worse. That's why the government's chosen this place to announce how it's going to spend billions of pounds on flood protection schemes across the country. This is to better protect our uh, homes, our communities, our businesses uh, and make us more resilient to climate change. We know we're going to get more extreme weather events. We need to be prepared for them. Despite the influx of cash, eventually hard decisions will have to be made about who and what is protected from the rising water. Roughly one in every five households is at risk of flooding. There may come a time in the future where as part of that building back better, we need to consider whether we move to better places where the risk of flooding is reduced. Global warming is reshaping our world in other ways too. In terms of sheer destructive power, rain and flooding often grabs the headlines in the UK. But climate change is also driving up our temperatures. At the Met Office headquarters in Exeter, they've been tracking some worrying patterns. This is where operational meteorologists... Um, Senior climate scientist Mike Kendon has just written a report revealing that 2020 was the first year since records began to rank in the top 10 for heat, rainfall and sunshine. Climate change isn't just something that's going to happen in the future. 
Climate change is something that is happening now. We see that very clearly in our observations. As a scientist, I'm worried at look, looking at these observations. Um, you know, I'm a dad. I, I worry about the future for my children. The Royal Meteorological Society has warned that even a small increase in global warming could mean British summertime temperatures reaching 40 degrees. In this country, the race to adapt to the effects of climate change has only just begun. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News, Avonmouth. Well, more on that in a moment, but now some breaking news. New NHS figures show that a record 689,313 alerts, uh, so-called pings, were sent to users of the NHS COVID-19 app in England and Wales in the week ending uh, July the 2nd. Uh, uh, this means that, I think that must be July the 21st, this means that there have been uh, they have been in close contact with someone who had tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, this is an increase week on week of 11.4%. Well, let's get more from uh, Sky's Ali Fortescue. So if you're pinged, you're supposed to isolate and more and more people have been told to do that. Yeah, that's right. Um, just to clarify, this is the NHS app. So this, these, this isn't legally binding in the same way that if someone's called up by an NHS contact tracer, they have to isolate. This is someone who's been in the vicinity and has therefore got this alert telling them to self-isolate. But as you say, another record-breaking week. So 689,000 people told to self-isolate uh, in the week ending last Wednesday. Uh, the week before that, the figure was just under 620,000. So a significant increase. We're saying the number was down slightly in Wales, but was up significantly uh, in England. And obviously this ties into the concern we have seen around the so-called pingdemic, the number of people being told to self-isolate, the impact that that is having uh, on businesses and on the workforce. And it ties in too um, with this issue around compliance. And there are separate figures out today from the Office for National Statistics that suggest that compliance uh, is coming down. Overall, it is still high but it is coming down particularly uh, among young people since May. So people aged between 18 uh, and 34, uh, one in four uh, of those people in that age bracket have not been following those self-isolation rules. And we know uh, that this week the government uh, revealed their list of key workers that won't have to follow self-isolation rules uh, in the same way. We know that later on in August those rules are going to be scrapped uh, altogether. But, but as you say, another record-breaking week uh, and more than 600 and 80,000 people told to self-isolate on the app within the space of a week. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, now we can return to today's stock warning about the UK's climate now and uh, the extremes uh, of rain, sunshine and heat which the UK is now experiencing. We can speak to the Shadow Environment Secretary, Luke Pollard. Thank you for being with us, Mr Pollard. Uh, the climate emergency, as people increasingly call it, is a matter of concern for all political parties. Uh, what, in your view, should the government, the Conservative government, be doing that it isn't uh, to deal with uh, this threat? Well, you're right. We are in the middle of a climate and ecological crisis. And I fear at the moment we're seeing a victory of sound bites over delivery from the government. We really do need to see a faster decarbonisation of our economy and we need to see faster work to protect biodiversity, to protect nature. We have far too many species facing extinction, far too many habitats being destroyed. All of that, I think, means that we need to recognise that ministers will need to do things in a different way than we've seen so far. We will need to accelerate the programmes to reduce emissions from our housing, uh, which means more focus on getting a green home scheme that actually works because the government scrapped their one currently, which means we're not decarbonising our buildings, which account for about 30 to 40% of emissions across the country. But we need to see a rapid acceleration of decarbonisation of our transport systems as well, with a proper rollout of electric vehicle charging points and move away from using diesel and petrol engines for all forms of transport, not just uh, cars. And at the moment, as we're leading up to COP26, I fear we are saying the right words, but we're not doing the right actions. And the floods that we've seen in the past week really need to be a wake-up call that we won't solve the climate crisis, we won't protect vulnerable communities 
if all we're doing is uh, issuing press releases. We need to see proper delivery and action from governments. I'm afraid that's just not what we're seeing at the moment. What about uh, putting a, a carbon charge element into goods crossing international borders? That's a, a proposal which isn't on the COP agenda at the moment, which some economists think might actually change the consumption of carbon or the uh, release of carbon around the world. Well, I think that's a, a good idea worth looking at. Uh, uh, in our post-Brexit position as a country, the new trade deals the government want, is wanting to sign seems to be giving a greater focus on countries on the other side of the planet. The Australia trade deal, for instance, will see food imported from the, literally the other side of the planet undercutting our own farmers. And when we know that our food production in Britain, for instance, is some of the lowest carbon in the world, our beef is some of the lowest produced, the lowest carbon uh, that we have, importing higher carbon uh, produced food from the other side of the planet and then spending the time importing it using carbon in its import doesn't make any sense. I think we need to be backing our British farmers, backing production within Britain much more, rather than relying on uh, imports from the other side of the planet, uh, having a clear carbon label, having the information that so consumers can understand the products they're buying and what their impact on the environment is, is a necessary part of that, I think. But looking at uh, about a carbon tax is an area that I think uh, should be looked at in the rounds, because ultimately, we're not going to solve the carbon crisis if all we do is offshore Britain's emissions to other countries, because wherever the carbon is being used around the world, we're still on the same planet. And at the moment, the planet is on fire, and I don't want it to uh, pass on a dying planet to our children and grandchildren. That's why this action has to be much swifter and bolder than we're seeing at the moment. Well, what about fuel duties, though? Because it seems that, although that was built into the tax system, it, it's frankly, a political impossibility to uh, uh, increase duties on, on, on petrol and diesel? Well, there's a real concern here. because I, th I think this debate, when it focuses on, you know, are we putting people off driving, needs to be slightly different. We need to look at how we encourage and incentivise cleaner forms of propulsion. So how do we make sure that every bus in Britain is run on hydrogen or electric rather than on dirty diesel? How do we make sure that every single community has access to an electric vehicle charging point? How do we make sure that electric vehicles are more affordable to buy? How do we make sure that our public transport system encourages more people to get out their cars onto buses, trams and trains, and uh, with a greater focus on walking and cycling as well? I think all too often, this debate is uh, structured by what are the big sticks government can use to hit people with, rather than where are the carrots, where's the incentives to encourage us all to make better decisions? Because I don't know a single person who doesn't want to be greener, who doesn't want to decarbonise, but all too often the interventions, the things we can do to decarbonise are only available if you've got bags of cash in your pocket. Buying an electric vehicle is not cheap still. The government withdrawing the subsidy on electric vehicles is only making that worse. So how can government help provide incentives for all of us to decarbonise faster? That's why ministers have this key role to play. And with COP26 now only a few months away, we need to be leading by example, not just in the press releases coming from government ministers, but in terms of the actual delivery of action and we're missing our carbon targets at the moment, so we're off track. And if we don't get back on track, the idea of limiting global temperature rises to only 1.5 degrees uh, won't be possible. And as the report shows today, we are going to uh, experience more severe weather more frequently. We don't have the resilience that we need at the moment, and we're not on track to avert the climate crisis. It really needs to be a wake-up call for much stronger action uh, to protect biodiversity and to decarbonise our economy. Mr Pollard, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. And don't forget, uh, you can keep up with all the stories affected by global uh, climate on our daily climate show. That's right here on Sky News. You can see that every weekday at 6.30pm and 9.30pm. Now, uh, the Foreign Secretary gave new hope to people wanting some summer sun abroad this morning. Uh, Dominic Raab told Sky News he was increasingly hopeful more countries may move up to amber and the green lists at the next travel announcement. I think, personally, feels like the momentum forward is positive because 
uh, as I say, because of the double vaccination reaching 70% of the adult population in this country. We've done the job we had to do domestically, and as we see other countries catch up, if you like, I think we're increasingly confident that more countries will go uh, to, 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 uh, on, on the, uh, either on amber or, or, or onto green. Well, we, we, we can't give uh, cast iron guarantees about what the next review system will decide. If, 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 if we did, it wouldn't be a very meaningful review system. Well, let's take a look at the current rules for travellers. Uh, at the moment, British travellers from green list destinations, which include Malta, Madeira and Australia, do not have to quarantine after landing in the UK, but they are required to take a coronavirus test before and after arriving. British arrivals from amber list countries, including Spain, Portugal and the United States of America, are only exempt from quarantine if they are fully vaccinated or under the age of 18. But from next Monday, this rule will be extended to EU and US visitors as well. Tougher rules will continue to remain in place for France, however, as arrivals will be required to isolate at home for 10 days, even if they have been double jabbed. And people coming from red list countries, including Turkey, the United Arab Emirates and India, will have to quarantine or do have to quarantine in a hotel. Well, with me is our political correspondent, uh, Kate McCann. And Kate, I don't, don't know what it's going to do for the environment if more people are travelling abroad, but they're going to be able to do it. Is that right? They will. And part of this is the economic argument for it, of course, because the UK government is very aware that a lot of industry, a lot of business that's done here is people coming in and out, travelling for meetings, travelling for business, and allowing people to do that when they're double jabbed more easily will, they hope, make it better for UK businesses who have been struggling, as we know. I think there's also an element of this, which is if the UK goes first, then perhaps there will be some confidence. The government is pretty secure in the knowledge that a significant number of people have now been double jabbed, they feel that the infection rate is going down enough to be able to do this. I think it's still early for the Americans. They seem to be more hesitant. Those discussions at diplomatic level are going on about trying to see reciprocal arrangements. And it's worth mentioning that around a dozen European countries still have quite strict measures too for UK travellers. But the hope is that the UK government will widen this list out and there will be more people who will be able to join it and travel more easily between destinations. And as we sort of adapt to changing circumstances, Government attitudes seem to be changing a little bit as well, don't they? They are. I think we've seen a bit of back and forth on vaccination, for example, this week. We saw Michael Gove at the start of the week saying it was a very selfish thing to do if you weren't vaccinated. There's definitely a move to try and encourage people by gentle kind of arguments. Therese Coffey, for example, was suggesting that people need to be given more information if they're vaccine hesitant, but also a little bit of stick too, not just carrot, because there is now a sense that even the government is considering the idea of people being double jabbed in the workplace. And there are a number of businesses who have already said they will do this. Netflix, Google, Facebook, for example, have said that staff have to be double vaccinated. And Dominic Raab was asked exactly that question today, whether it's something that he would support. I can understand why employers think that that would be a smart policy uh, or approach to encourage whether or not there should be hard and fast legal rules. I think we need to look at carefully. But our message is overwhelmingly um, get the jab. Life gets back to normal much more swiftly and in a much more confident way if people have got two jabs. So certainly quite warm language there, and you and I both know when that kind of uh, language is deployed, it usually means it's something that the government is considering. Now, there would, of course, be different cases for people who medically can't get the vaccination, mm -hmm. but one thing is certain, that this is the key. We know that people need to be vaccinated in order to move on to the next stage, but it's also going to start to unlock travel. One thing worth mentioning, does it mean that we will likely see more domestic vaccine passports for entering gigs, even potentially bars and restaurants as some... All going to work, indeed. And... Well, I mean, that's the question, and that would be legally controversial. I mean, Pimlico Plumbers, for example, a company has yeah. said you can't be employed with them unless you are vaccinated. And they've said so far they've had nobody object to that policy after information. But that would be incredibly controversial. But passports for events, we've already seen that. Could it creep further? We'll have to wait and see. Kate McCann, thank you very much indeed. Well, there's been both success and disappointment for Team GB at the Olympics uh, overnight into this morning. Uh, first thing, the rower Helen Glover, who returned to the Olympics after retiring uh, to raise her family and have three children, narrowly missed out on a medal with her partner Polly Swan. Uh, they came fourth 
in spite of missing out uh, on a podium place. Uh, Glover told our correspondent Tom Parmenter in Tokyo she is incredibly proud of what they've achieved and that she has been on a huge journey. Every stroke I took before London and before Rio was thinking about gold and outcome. And this time it's been about journey, about getting home in time for their nap time, about, you know, what, what time their next snack is and what time bedtime is and fitting rowing around life. And um, so, yeah, it changes again, like, like Polly was saying about the pandemic, it's changing your perspective. So does being a parent. And I think that um, making them proud, but also having them part of my journey was always really important to me. Meanwhile, Matt Coward Holly collected the bronze medal for shooting in the men's trap final today as the world and European champion, the 26 year old from Chelmsford, uh, had been a favourite to win gold, but he was beaten by the Czech duo of Jury Liptak and David Kostelecki. The uh, female canoeist Mallory Franklin uh, won the silver medal in the women's single slalom, building on her success on Wednesday of recording the fastest time uh, in both heats. And we can speak now to uh, Mallory Franklin's fiance, Kieran Lee Edwards, uh, who joins me now. Uh, pretty exciting time for you, Kieran. Oh, what, what a morning and what a role. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, delighted uh, that Mal's done so and uh, really put herself out there today. And, and th this is the first time a woman has been in, been in this event, Slalom. I mean, wh what does it involve? It really is. Um, so, yeah, C1 Women uh, is the first time this uh, category's been in the Games. We've had the kayak women um, historically, uh, but great to see the addition of the C1 there. It, the, the discipline has really pushed on since uh, it was confirmed that it was going to be included in the Games. And Mallory and Jess, who are first and second today, have really pushing the boundaries of what's possible in that discipline, keeping the men honest. Um, and uh, we saw a great final there. And, and have you uh, managed to speak to Mallory uh, since uh, she got silver? I think she's been super busy with, with media and, uh, and things. We did just manage to say uh, a few words, uh, which was really nice. Um, but she's coming home on Saturday, uh, so we'll get time to catch up then. And um, what about you? Are you, are you a, a, a big canoeist as well? Or is it right to call it canoeing uh, even? Uh, yes, yeah, by all means, uh, canoeing is definitely the right right terminology. Yes, uh, Mallory and I actually met um, on, a, on a riverbank when we were about nine years old. Um, and uh, here we are today with Mallory at the Olympics. Uh, yeah, we're getting married later later this year actually as well. Um, so yeah, we've we've really been through it all together, um, and we've we've raced on junior and under twenty three and senior teams uh, uh, right the way through there. Which is and, really and you're going to have a waterborne uh, marriage or not? A <laughs> wedding ceremony? <laughs> you, you'd think so, maybe, but no. We we uh, our venue is actually right next to a, so we've got the calming noise of some water uh, in the background for the big day. Well, uh, many congratulations for that. Uh, and uh, congratulations, of course, to Mallory on getting silver. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. You're watching All Out Politics. Coming up next, the future of Unite. We take a look at the candidates hoping to take over from Len McCluskey at the trade union. What could it all mean for Labour? I witnessed how the Catalan fight for independence split families. It was from this chamber that Carlos Puigdemont declared independence in October. I come here because I want to show other people what happened. I'm Michelle Clifford and I'm Sky's Europe correspondent. It's not the aim of the smugglers to actually get people to UK shores, but simply into British waters. 
We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. There are real concerns here now about whether the health system will be able to cope. President Macron has spoken in defence of freedom of expression, saying France won't give up its caricatures and drawings made by people who dare to challenge. Afternoon, Mr Barnier. How are you? I have no time for any politics. government anger about wider social and economic problems in this nation. We are on the verge of fascism and we have a country to save. Well, some breaking news. Uh, Japan has confirmed that it is extending its COVID-related state of emergency in Tokyo and Okinawa. Uh, province uh, through August uh, the 31st. That's being reported by uh, the national broadcaster NHK in Japan. And of course, it means all the COVID restrictions will stay in place for the duration of the Olympics. The uh, favourite for the men's pole vault uh, has had to withdraw because he's tested positive and another pole vaulting team has gone into isolation. So uh, COVID very much a factor. Well, after a decade in charge, Unite 71-year-old General Secretary Len McCluskey is finally retiring and the race is on to replace him. His influential union, which has uh, 1.2 million members, is at a turning point and the decision about who's in charge could change the balance of power in Labour politics. Uh, there are three candidates on the ballot paper, all with different visions for the future, as Sky's political correspondent Joe Pike reports. We are stronger than our enemies. After 10 years at the top. Despite the smears and the sneers. As a staunch ally of Jeremy Corbyn and a consistent critic of Keir Starmer. If you have no stomach from this fight, depart the battlefield. Len McCluskey is retiring. Whoever succeeds him will have a big influence on the future of UK politics. There were four candidates, three of whom work for Len McCluskey at Unite HQ, Howard Beckett, Steve Turner and Sharon Graham. Plus Jared Coyne, the moderate, some would say right-wing, challenger. But Howard Beckett damaged his own campaign by tweeting that Priti Patel should be deported. He was suspended from the Labour Party, later pulled out of the contest and gave his backing to fellow left-winger Steve Turner. How did you persuade Howard Beckett to back you? What is in that deal? Well, there was no deal with Howard Beckett. Howard came to me and we had a conversation about him withdrawing and supporting me. And that's fine, that's so a great offered position. offered him nothing? No, that's a great position. Steve Turner seems to be the front runner. Some call him the continuity candidate because he's Len McCluskey's choice. You know, I owe the union my life, um, quite literally. Mr Turner says he understands the struggles of workers after battling dyslexia and unemployment in his teens. I remember walking six miles for a job once and the interviewer didn't even turn up. So every job matters to me. The candidate keen to cause an upset is Gerard Coyne. He stood against McCluskey last time and got close to beating him. Your critics say you are the right-wing candidate. I'm the mainstream candidate, is the reality of it. I've been an active trade unionist all my life. Steve is supported by the Communist Party. Sharon Graham is supported by the Socialist Worker Party. I've been a member of the Labour Party all my adult life. Part of Mr Coyne's campaign has been highlighting the almost £100 million of members' money spent on a hotel and conference centre in Birmingham. He wants an independent inquiry. I'm running because I think there needs to be real change in the union. I think it needs to focus on the workplace much more. Well, I think the interesting thing Veteran campaigner Sharon Graham was pressured to pull out of the race by others on the union's left. I have had a huge amount of stick for not standing aside for supposedly uh, whose turn it is to be the next for General Steve Secretary. Turner. Yes, for, for Steve Turner. Um, but for me, I'm standing for a very particular reason. I think that's the important thing. I'm standing because I absolutely believe that the union must now focus on the workplace. Whoever wins the race to run this union is unlikely to be as outspoken and pugnacious as Len McCluskey. All three candidates say if they get the job, they'll focus a little less on Labour. But let's be clear, this is a massive organisation with an income of around £200 million a year and big influence. Its next general secretary could reshape left-wing politics in this country 
for years to come. Voting via post has now begun. Will Unite's new direction help or hinder Keir Starmer? We'll find out at the end of next month. Joe Pike, Sky News. Well, Joe's uh, with me now. And, and obviously you looked at the union there, but what is at stake really for Keir Starmer here? Well, a, a huge amount is at stake because the union and Len McCluskey are so significant. Keir Starmer has many problems, but Unite and Mr McCluskey are one of them because it does have this sprawling influence. It has tentacles, really, I mean, across the structure of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn, he was a very big backer of Jeremy Corbyn. He supported a Milligan band against his uh, brother, David. But there are different ways that Unite are influential in Labour. Funding the democratic processes, but also the narrative around the leader. Funding is obviously important now because we know just last week uh, Labour announced uh, a, a round of redundancies. They're in a bad financial position, partly because membership has dipped after Mr Corbyn left the job, partly because they're still paying various legal bills around anti-Semitism cases. And the fact that Unite is such a rich organisation, income annually of around £200 million, means that its financial support is significant. In terms of the democratic processes, Unite has a seat on the ruling NEC, the National Executive Committee of Labour. They have, uh, of course, delegates at the annual conference where some key decisions are sometimes uh, made. And also, of course, they're pushing for their own uh, people to be MPs and to take on seats. And then there's also, perhaps most prominently, uh, shaping the narrative around the leader. Now, Keir Starmer has had a very, uh, a slightly rocky 16 months uh, oh, in office, hasn't he? hasn't been able to give a speech to a full room. Yeah. Partly because of COVID and the pandemic, yeah. uh, partly uh, because, I mean, you look at Hartlepool, that was a very difficult yeah. moment. And what adds to that is if someone like Len McCluskey is being critical, but also if there are stories about him considering Unite uh, with, withdrawing support, he's got a tough enough job facing the Conservatives without having internal battles uh, to uh, fight as well. So for those sort of three reasons, if Keir Starmer had somebody who was more uh, supportive, uh, less pugnacious like Len McCluskey, right. he'd probably be in a better situation. People close to Keir Starmer do say he'd be OK with uh, Steve Turner, but I think if they had Gerard Coyne in place, they'd probably be most confident of not getting uh, this sort of torrent of criticism we've had in recent years. And uh, three candidates, uh, what do you reckon? Who, who, who's, who's, who's the most likely to emerge? Well, Steve Turner, I think, is the, the apparent favourite, the guy backed by uh, Mr McCluskey. A lot of people say he's, he's a nice guy, he's a popular, well-known person in the union. Gerard Coyne, who ran against McCluskey last time, got within about 5,000 votes of beating him, almost came from nowhere. He seems remarkably confident that he can actually do it. Look, all the candidates say they can win, but Mr Coyne does seem to think that things are going his direction. And then Sharon Graham is significant as well because she does have a lot of grassroots support. And, of course, turnout will be very uh, important. It's usually 12, 13, 14, 15, 15%. So a very small proportion of members are actually voting, but that could be significant. And with three candidates, you could see, uh, you know, the left vote, for example, being split, maybe Mr Coyne coming uh, through the middle, uh, or Mr Turner perhaps winning and keeping the McCluskey uh, flame alive. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, Joe Pike there. Well, coming up next, we're going to take a look at all the opinions and talking points in today's newspapers and news websites in The View.
Well, time now for The View and the latest opinions and talking points in today's newspapers and news websites. And in the Daily Telegraph, uh, the cartoon there has tourists arriving into the UK following yesterday's relaxing of travel restrictions. Visit the home of the Kent variant. Uh, that's the message uh, on the welcome poster. Uh, Stephen Glover in the Daily Mail believes that with COVID in retreat, uh, Boris Johnson must show what he really stands for. Uh, and uh, the newspaper's cartoon goes with the title West End Reopens. Uh, it takes us to a performance of The Phantom of the Opera, which has opened as the star of the show is pinged live on stage. Uh, Rod Little, writing The Sun, goes with the headline, Economy is out of the blocks and heading for gold, following the IMF's upbeat prediction for the country's financial recovery. Uh, in The Times, uh, David Aronovich says anti-vaxxers are in danger of becoming a cult, as he warns on the threat of uh, disinformation and violence following a series of protests in London. He's long looked at conspiracy theorists as one of his main interests. In the Financial Times, Robert Shrimsley, their political columnist, uh, writes about football, saying anyone who wants to understand how far the Prime Minister's Conservative Party has shifted should study his approach uh, to the national game. And writing in the Daily Express, the Home Secretary pledges her unconditional support to the country's police officers to help them cut crime. Of course, they recently voted no confidence in her. And in The Guardian, Martin Kettle uh, also uh, focuses on Priti Patel's crime announcements. He says ministers are keen to refocus on the post-COVID agenda. Well, joining me today, looking through all those, are the assistant comment editor of The Daily Telegraph, Olivia Utley, and Jolly Ball, writer uh, for The New Statesman. Nice to see you both. Um, Olivia, I know you follow football closely. Um, I, what did you make of Robert Shrimsley's argument, basically saying that uh, because there are a lot of voters in key football areas, uh, Boris Johnson's gone against um, Tory laissez-faireism and wants to intervene? Um, I'm not a huge <laughs> football follower. I think there's probably some truth in that. I think Boris Johnson will always do whatever he thinks is going to be popular at that particular second. Um, I think that's one of his big problems, really. So, yeah, I, I see where he's coming from. I mean, John, it, 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 you know, I suppose the key moment was when the government turned against the new European Super League. That was a huge moment, yeah. Um, Robert says in his article that David Cameron said uh, a few years ago that it wasn't up to the government to regulate football. And now um, Therese Coffey uh, has come out with some interim findings um, into uh, football governance and she's recommended a uh, government regulator to take over the run of football, including recommendations about uh, pay to uh Pay to club profit ratios. Um, so yeah, maybe I, I, I like the theory. This is this this is part of the new sort of conservative interventionist model. Um, it's it's not the biggest sign of it. I mean, sort of them breaking peacetime spending records and perhaps uh, the new interventionism we've seen in transport with the creation of GBR, which gives the state a far greater role in the running of trains than we've seen since privatization in the nineties. All these are signal signals towards a sort of leftward leftward shift. In, in terms of economics of the Conservative Party. Yeah, and uh, Tracy Crouch came up the report, as, as you say, and do you think it is... Sorry, Tracy Crouch, yeah, do, do you think it's going to work uh, as far as securing Boris Johnson's Conservatives in, in the former Red Wall? Uh, it remains to be seen. I think perhaps more important in the Red Wall is that they start to see people, people and living in those new blue constituencies start to see some of this levelling up money come through. Um, at the moment, we've seen a pretty th threadbare um, fleshing out of what levelling up actually means. There's sort of five billion plot here with the levelling up funds, a similar amount with the community renewal funds. But it really need, we really need to see some flesh to the bones of what levelling up means and some real sort of changes come to those those communities and those constituencies. And now, you, Olivia, what, what, what do you think of, of, of the anti-vaxxers? Uh, you know, it, it is sort of fascinating how both here and in the United States and in other countries, they seem to become almost a political movement. Yeah, and it was really interesting, I thought, that David Aronovich column. He talks about how previous sort of conspiracy theories normally settle into, into one of three camps. There are the sort of um, the, the, the kind of 
ones who are obsessed with a particular tragedy, so Diana's death theorists and 9-11 theorists, that normally doesn't come with a sort of overarching point of view. Then there are the sort of they're out to get our kids ones. Um, and those two things have sort of come together in these anti-vaxxers who are extremely, well, getting on for violent, it seems, in some places. And he thinks it's the same sort of uh, phenomenon which drove the, the storming of the, of the capital. And if that's the case, then, then it's quite scary, because as you say, they are forming this pretty cohesive political unit, and they, they could pose a genuine serious threat. He thinks that the answer to it, and I, I think he's probably right, is sort of serious journalists. He mentions the BBC and the Times, um, I'd say the Telegraph as well, other, other mainstream media outlets, um, explaining why these people are wrong and giving the right information um, is what we need to be doing more of, much better than the kind of social media takedown. I think he's absolutely right that, that it does feel a bit like fighting the tide when there are when there are really quite a lot of them and they're they're gaining a lot of traction on social media, both here and in the US. And, and interesting, Johnny, that they have support both on the extreme right and the extreme left. Yeah, David talks about that in the article. It's sort of a strange amalgamation of sort of new age ideas and QAnon and conspiracy theories about 5G and Bill Gates wanting to track us through the vaccination. I think it's sort of, it, it's it's scary, but a bit unsurprising that we've seen the rise of this through, through lockdown in the last sort of 16 to 18 months of the pandemic, because a lot of people have been sat at home scrolling um, through a load of nonsense on their phones and um, you know sharing memes like they uh, like they like they're the truth on WhatsApp, etc. And at the end of the day, we've all been through an incredibly difficult um, best part of eighteen months locked up, and people are looking for answers and people are looking for comfort. And I think sometimes conspiracy theories can um, apply order to what is essentially a sort of chaotic and confusing situation. And what do you make, um, Olivia, of uh, Pretty Patel's love letter to the uh, boys in blue, or the boys and girls in blue? Yeah, I mean, I don't really buy into Martin Gavel's column in The Guardian that it's all a sort of performative cruelty stuff. Um, I just think that Pretty Patel is doing what every Home Secretary before her has done for the last sort of 40, 50 years, saying that she's going to get tough on crime, saying that she's behind the police. She knows she's pretty unpopular with the police at the moment. So this is her attempt to, to reverse that. My biggest problem with the with the police and crime strategy is that there's really very, very little um, that's new in it. And, and the things which are new in it, they don't seem to have talked through with the police and don't seem to stand much of a chance of coming to fruition. Um, so I, I don't think it's this sort of big thing that Priti Patel is trying to become party leader by by being so cruel that that these horrible Tories um, cleave to her. I don't think that's true at all. I just think that it's a sort of desperate attempt by Boris Johnson when he's seeing, he looks at the polls every day, he's obsessed with polling, he's seeing that they're going down and he knows, right, well, crime is the thing which, which Tories are famous for doing well. Um, crime is the thing people are worried about, especially as we're coming out of lockdown and uh, crime is on the rise again. Um, so that's something where we can where we can make a difference. So he's come out with this sort of half bait um, strategy, which is which is mostly about rhetoric, um, and and Pretty's just sort of playing her part in in that sort of um, strategy today with that piece. Thank you both very much indeed. This is all out politics. Coming up next, uh, compromise. A new Lord's report calls for patience and trust to break the Northern Ireland Protocol and pass. Well, um, I just put a tweet out to say <laughs> that Melissa was 18 on the 16th of July and what could we do to make it really, really special? So I thought, I know, we'll carry her up Snowden. So I asked for, is there any way this could happen if anyone would volunteer to help us? And uh, the Steve Prescott Foundation very kindly said, yes, come on, let's make this happen. So there was lots of planning um, and together with um, Conquer Hiking and Trekking, the guys from there, Jonathan especially, they put a team together and they carried, pushed, pulled and got Melissa right to the top of Snowden, which was amazing. We took the Lamberis route and walking up Snowden is hard on its own, but walking up Snowden with a wheelchair with Melissa in it is even harder. The wheelchair and Melissa weighed about 70 kilograms together and you've got to think lifting that over rocks, over steps over the train tracks, it was just immense. I can't thank them enough and I can't tell you how amazing they were. 
They worked in teams. Morning, Britain. Um, and to get up oh, my the mountain, as you say, was, was really, really like hard work. Six, but then coming 600... down, you've also got the added um, danger of the wheelchair running away. So they had to have, they, they used the ropes uh, to make sure that they actually had to, enough tension to stop the wheelchair going along. So that took even more strength, um, which when, once you, you've hiked all the way up there, you've got to use more strength to get back down again safely. But they did, and uh, it was an absolutely amazing day. Angela said it's a genetic condition, uh, which primarily affects her nervous system. So Melissa has um, epilepsy. She can't speak. She has um, balance and movement issues. Um, she has a very poor sleep pattern. So she does have an awful lot of things to deal with on a day-to-day on -day basis. We try to take her as many places as we can and experience as many exciting things as we can. And Snowden just seemed to be the most obvious because it's, it's one of the closest. And um, she, she is now the first person with Angelman syndrome to have actually conquered there. So uh, I just thought it, it was really special and it would just make her 18th birthday that, that little bit more <laughs> individual and uh, yeah, just special for her. Do Good sponsors Sky News financial updates. Do Good sponsors Sky News financial updates. Location and style of trust are the major characteristics required to secure a breakthrough on the controversial Northern Ireland Protocol. That is the verdict of a new report uh, by the House of Lords Committee that calls on both the UK and the European Union uh, to resolve their differences urgently on post-Brexit trading rules. The report says compromises must be made to prevent Northern Ireland and its people becoming permanent casualties of the withdrawal process. Well, joining me now is uh, Lord Jay, Michael Jay. He's the chair of the Protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland a Committee in the House of Lords, of course, uh, for that very senior diplomat indeed. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us, Lord Jay. Uh, you're calling for compromise, uh, which I suspect everyone would like to see. It's not really what we're hearing either from uh, Brussels or Westminster, is it? No, not at the moment, uh, which is one of the reasons why we say we, we, we really badly need it. Um, uh, what we've found so far is that both sides have been really uh, sticking to their basic fundamental principles, if you like, uh, the UK on um, the need for a pure Brexit and the EU on the need for a pure single market. Uh, what we need now is a compromise between the two. We need them to get together uh, and to negotiate with a real and genuine commitment to reach an agreement for the sake of Northern Ireland and the people of Northern Ireland. And that's what up to now has been missing and what we really need. Now, as, as of last week, Lord Frost and the government, therefore, our British government, are saying effectively the protocol must go, it needs to be rewritten. The European Union is saying, no, you agree to it, it's a done deal, we've got to work within it. Uh, where does the committee stand on that? Does it, does it want to replace the protocol? Well, what it wants is that for there to be a real commitment, a real uh, a negotiation between both sides, which has a chance of reaching an agreement. Uh, if both sides just stand on the positions which they're now on, there's not going to be an agreement. Well, could, it, could it be Neither rewriting it, do you think? Would, would, would that be acceptable, you know, bearing in mind it was something which we, we signed up to? Yes, there's going to have to be a rewriting. There's going to have to be a, a, a really hard look from both sides at some of the aspects of the protocol, uh, which will need to be rewritten. Now, that's not saying that it's all going to have to be thrown away, but there's going to have to be a, 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 a real commitment by both sides to look at it again and to look at ways in which you can reach the agreement that is needed in the interests of Northern Ireland. At the, at the, at the moment, we're frankly not, not seeing that. And unless we see that, we're 
we're not going to get an agreement which is needed. In practical terms, though, this could all be pretty much solved, couldn't it, if the UK was prepared to say it would follow uh, phytosanitary veterinary regulations uh, that the uh, Europeans uh, have in place? Well, if there, were, if there was an agreement on, uh, on plant health and animal health, that would certainly remove 80% of the checks which would otherwise be needed on goods going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. But at the moment, the, the two sides are, 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 are locked in their, own, uh, in, in, in their own little hatches on this, and the, the EU is uh, insisting on one approach and the UK is insisting on another approach, and one can understand why they're both doing that. But what they need to do is to look for ways in between where they can reach an agreement. Now, they could reach agreement on that. You're absolutely right. That would make a real difference. Uh, and uh, I hope that that is what is going to happen as a result of the uh, uh, command paper which the British government issued last week, to which the European Union have said, OK, we'll look at that. We'll meanwhile uh, freeze our, uh, uh, our, legal, our legal action and uh, we'll come back to all this in September. And what we've got to hope for now is that in September there will be a more reasonable approach from both sides. Let's hope. Do you think there has been a significant shift with Brexit in the British government's attitude towards Northern Ireland? I mean, it, time was where the rubric was that the Westminster government had no strategic, uh, economic or selfish interest in keeping Northern Ireland. But since, since Brexit, has that changed? Yes, it has changed because the... Uh, the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, uh, was made was extremely difficult to achieve. But that was made possible because both Ireland and uh, both um, the Great Britain and Ireland were members of the European Union. When we decided to leave the European Union, so of course a, a vote by, by by referendum, then that has made the achievement uh, of uh, stability and peace in Northern Ireland harder. Uh, that is why a protocol is needed. Uh, and uh, now there has to be a greater sense of, um, uh, of compromise and commitment in order to reach an agreement. It's, it's not easy. It's not, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be reached by the end of September, which is the sort of deadline which is there. I think that's going to have to be extended. Uh, but it, it, there has to be an agreement in the next few months or the, the businesses which need stability and certainty and Northern Ireland consumers who need... Uh, stability and certainty are the ones that are going to suffer. I think the other thing that is needed is that <laughs> both uh, Great Britain and uh, the European Union need to put Northern Ireland at the heart of the negotiations rather than their own concerns. I think that matters a lot. Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Lord Jay, there on his uh, new report today from his committee on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Well, what about the weather? Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, the uh, focus is on the southwest today, where a deep area of low pressure is bringing in heavy rain and gales. Uh, the fourth uh, uh, named summer storm, Evert, uh, is due to bring severe gales uh, to Cornwall and the Scilly Islands uh, with uh, gusts of up to 75 miles per hour. Channel coasts uh, are also in for gales throughout the night. And for much of the day, there'll be a north-south divide in the weather. Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England should be largely cloudy with showery rain. Some of this will be heavy and possibly thundery. England and Wales, though, largely dry with sunny spells, although a few showers uh, are likely to bubble up. Increasingly, cloud will bring rain to southern Ireland, Wales and the southwest later on in the afternoon. Winds will begin to freshen reaching gale force or severe gale force later in the evening. Overnight, wet and windy weather will spread across much of England and Wales. Uh, that will mean the night will be stormy. Gales will continue in the southwest and along Channel coasts. Uh, north of the storm, showers will become largely confined to the northeast of Scotland. So I think all in all, a lot of stormy weather around. Uh... The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
Well, that's it uh, from all our politics for today. Please join us again tomorrow, Friday. Coming up on Sky News, a stark climate change warning. The UK is getting hotter and wetter than ever before.